Well, thank you so much for the uh, leading us in worship today. It was good, wasn't it? Some great uh, hymns that we have in our heritage. Wonderful to, to sing and participate in those today. And I'd like you to take your Bible this morning, if you would, and turn to the book of John, the book of John. We're going to be in that very first chapter. And uh, many of you know, if you're regular attenders, that we have just finished up a survey of the Old Testament and looking at it a lot from the perspective of seeing Christ, the Messiah, as he was revealed and the prophecies pointed to him and uh, people were instructed to put their hope in God who would provide a, a Savior, uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we are now going to be stepping into the New Testament and uh, looking at the New Testament, uh, uh, kind of going through not every book, uh, but a lot of the highlights of the New Testament in that same way, kind of like the scarlet thread through all of Scripture. And hopefully this will give you kind of a broad look at the, the whole Bible, because the, the whole book is about Jesus. Can you say amen? The whole book is about him. It's all about Christ, uh, our Lord. And so... Uh, I will be coming back to this topic around Christmas time, but how many of you are surprised that Christmas is just around the corner already? And I don't want to skip over Thanksgiving at all because I love Thanksgiving, don't you? A uh, great time to meditate on the goodness of the Lord to all of us and how he's provided. And I know the stores have already jumped to Christmas, but we can't forget uh, Thanksgiving, uh, which, is, which is coming up. And so I will be coming back to the topic that I'm uh, talking about today around Christmas time uh, as we kind of explore the Word of God together. Uh, what I want to talk about today is about why Jesus came. Why did he come? Now there is a lot of interest about a lot of other things about the coming of Christ, like when he came, or how he came, or you know, some other uh, topic related to that. When he came, you know, those, those, those kind of things. But I think the most important thing is about why Jesus came. Would you agree with that? The purpose of his coming is the most important. What drew God to come from heaven? Uh, when we think about God, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Bible reveals to us they've always been, always were, always will be, uh, that they are one God and three persons, but not long ago, a little over 2,000 years ago, there was a change, and the second person of the Trinity took on flesh and came to dwell among us. And I don't know how many, you know, how long the Trinity existed. Uh, they've always been. It's hard for me to fathom that. But he started a thing called time, and we're in time. We have some reference about that. But the Bible says in the fullness of time, God sent his son to be the savior of the world. Just at the right exact time, he intervened into human history. And the purpose of his coming is, is really very, very important. So I want to focus on that this morning. And you know, uh, we've been studying John in our uh, Sunday school class, and uh, we're going to be in the, that part of the Word of God uh, even now. What I'd like you to do is, would you mind reaching across the aisle, if you can, and just putting your hand on someone as we pray this morning, uh, as we look into the Word of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, uh, your kindness and your love that are showed to us in so many ways. We thank you today, Lord, especially for your Word. And Father, your word has power, and we thank you for the power of the word of God. Lord, we are not interested, and in, Lord, uh, this morning especially, in Lord, uh, like genealogies, or Lord, myths or fables, uh, Lord, that uh, are around us. We are interested in the truth, because you said, he who knows the truth uh, will be set free by that truth. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, as we touch a person next to us, will we be open to the truth of God today as we look at this most important subject of your word of why Jesus came, why the one we sing about, celebrate, why he left heaven and came to the earth, and what that means for us 
as the, especially the bride of Christ. If there's someone here today who does not know Jesus in a personal way, I pray, O Holy Spirit of God, today would be the day. Today is the day of salvation, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray that they would open their heart, open their heart to this, to consider, even though maybe they thought that they were a Christian, because they've gone to church and they've done good things. Father, I would like them to consider their relationship with you today. It would be so sad, Lord, for some people to come before you, Lord, in the end, and for you to turn to them and say, I never knew you. Depart from me. And Father, that would be a tragedy. And Lord, for every one of us, we have to understand that we're lost before we can be saved. And so, Lord, as uh, we speak today, Father, I pray the person we're touching, Lord, would understand your truth and really have spiritual freedom today. Be honest with you. Be honest with themselves and be liberated today by the word of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so we want to kind of answer this question today, and we're going to be looking, beginning in the book of John, why Jesus came. And... uh, One of the primary reasons that he came was to show us what God the Father is really like. And so let's look at the Word of God, and let's look at what it says in John 1, 18. You know, in this chapter, he talks about, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. As I spoke uh, at the very beginning... Uh, we looked at the fact of that Jesus always was, always is. He's that second person of the Trinity. And then we find out in these verses that this word of God is Jesus himself because John gave a witness. John the Baptist gave a witness to the word of God who clearly is talking about Jesus Christ here. Now, it tells us in verse 14 that this word became flesh. And made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. The Greek is the monogenes, the one and only Son of God who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Now follow with me, uh, if you would. John testifies concerning him in verse 15. He cries out saying, this is the one whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through who? Jesus Christ. And notice verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, this monogenes of God, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. So Jesus has come and made known to us God the Father. And I want you to know uh, there is a lot of confusion about God. As a matter of fact, if you happen to be in my systematic theology study on Sunday night, we just happen to be in the section we are really are looking at the non-Christian worldviews. And so some of you are already going to be prepared for tonight, aren't you? I can see you're smiling at me already. And so uh, I want you to know that as I have studied these, we could just do this for information and say, well, I know what an atheist is, and I know what an agnostic is, or I know what a pantheist is, or I know what a polytheist is, and that's a really wonderful thing to know. But the thing that I think is more important to that is can you see through all these different views man's attempt to grope for God. And we have come up with all kinds of different beliefs about God, and they saturate our society. And some of us, uh, I want you to know, I I had ideas about God. And who is going to clear up all the confusion about God the Father? So, you know, we, we, we are looking at the atheistic view, the agnostic view, the pantheistic view. And uh, we even looked in pantheism, and there's so many other things like materialistic pantheism, helozoism, and panpsychism. Does any of you know what that is? Those are parts of the belief of pantheism, and neutralism, and idealism, and philosophical mysticism. 
And we, we look at all these different things, and what I see and I come away is, is, is that, that men are desperately wanting to know the true God, and they are groping for him. And isn't it wonderful that we have a God in heaven who understands our need, and he wanted to clear up all our confusion, and he actually left heaven and came to the earth so he could walk among us and we could see him, we could behold his glory, and we can know what God is really like. And it's an amazing thing when you, you look at Jesus, because I had all kinds of ideas. How many of you had the idea that God was a cosmic cop? Did anybody have that idea? I did. I thought God was the big policeman up in heaven. And what he was doing is he was looking down at the earth, particularly at me. I don't know if he was paying attention to the rest of the people, but he was paying attention to me. And he was watching every move that I made. And uh, when I did something that was uh, against his will or some kind of sin, he took note of it, and there was going to be some ramifications for that, that God was going to somehow deal with me. That was my idea of what God was all about. Uh, some of us have the idea, have you ever heard God talked about as the old man upstairs? That he, he is some kind of, he's got a little Alzheimer's, you know. And, uh, and he's upstairs, and he's benevolent, and he's, uh, he's very loving. But, you know, you only call upon him once in a while. You know, he's very compassionate, uh, those kind of things. Uh, but he really is not an integral part of your life. Uh, some see God as, as kind of, uh, you know, like you're in the, the, the hotel and you see that there's a fire extinguisher and then it's encased in glass. And, and what do you do when the fire starts? You break the glass in case of emergency and you get that tool out and you use it. And some people's idea is, is that I only go to God when what? When I'm in trouble. He's just something that's there a tool for me to use that I can call upon. Some people see God as a great vending machine. And you uh, call out to God and you push the right buttons and uh, your candy bar falls to the bottom. Doesn't get hung up on the, the spokes because he's God. And uh, have any of you ever shake some of those machines uh, when they don't work properly? Uh, and so uh, all kinds of conceptions of God, but... But Jesus cleared up all, uh, all of the confusion. And a lot of us, what we ended up with, unfortunately, even when we felt that we had good information of God, we ended up basically with, uh, with religion. And you know, religion really stinks. Did you know that? And you say, well, you're in church, you're a religious person. Religion is all about rules, isn't it? Religion is all about ritual. And uh, I was in church for years, and that's what we had. We had rules, and we had rituals, and, and that's what we, we had. And we knew when to kneel down, and when to stand up, and when to say this, and when to say that, but we had no real relationship with God. And uh, it made no difference in my day-to-day -day life. Did any of you remember when all it was was ritual, routine, and that's when it can fall into. Uh, Henry Thiessen in his book also talks about the, the Jews, and I, I just want to, to just read a little bit of what they ended up with and, and why it was so important that, that God revealed himself in the person of his son. In addition, God has revealed himself in his son, Jesus Christ. The general revelation of God did not lead the Gentile world to any clear apprehension of the existence or the nature of God. So nature was not enough. He, he builds on that. He further declared that the true wisdom none of the rulers of this age has understood. Do you see the, the groping? For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they really knew God, they wouldn't have crucified. But we did crucify him. And that's because we were ignorant of the, the, the real God. In spite of the general relation of God in nature, history, conscience, the Gentile word turned to mythology, polytheism, and idolatry. And this is this, what the scripture says. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. What a shame. 
A fuller revelation of God was greatly needed. This is not to say that natural revelation did not give to man some insight into the greatness and goodness of God. How many of you, when you look at the mountains and the trees, don't get some idea of the goodness and the gracious of God? And what a wonderful thing. Did you see the beauty of the morning this morning? The blue sky? And the birds were out early in the morning. And yeah, you got some idea, but really... Even that is not enough. The stars in the heavens were not enough. The ocean and all the animals were not enough. And it said, Neither did additional special revelation of God in miracle, prophecy, theophany lead Israel to a true knowledge of the nature and the will of God. And, and listen to what they had. They, they had the word of God, didn't they? But even that was not enough in the Old Testament. This is what ended up happening, by and large, among God's people who had revelation from him. This is what they ended up with. Neither did additional special revelation of God. A miracle prophecy theophany lead Israel to a true knowledge of the nature and the will of God. Israel believed in the existence of the true and living God, but they had imperfect and rather perverted notions of him. They regarded him chiefly as a great lawgiver, judge who insisted on scrupulous observances of the letter of the law but cared little for the inner state of the heart and the practice of justice mercy and faith as the one who must be placated with sacrifices persuaded with burnt offerings but did not need an infinite sacrifice and had no real abhorrence for sin that's what it, they ended up with. And this is what the conclusion of this. So many scripture verses. It talks about the Old Testament is full of love, mercy, and faithfulness of God. But Israel quickly turned to legalism. Isn't that easy to do? And they needed a fuller revelation of God. This we have in the person and the mission of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Christ is the center of history. Praise God. That's who we sing to. And of revelation. The writer of Hebrews says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days, has spoken to us, and you finish it, spoken to us in his Son, Jesus Christ. That's why we sing Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Uh, What a wonderful uh, name he has. So the scripture tells us that. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. And Philip said this, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And what did Jesus say? Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? even after I have been among you such a long time. Anyone who has seen me has seen who? The Father. How can you say, show us the Father? If you ever wondered what God the Father was like, the true God of the universe who put all this in the motion, and thank God he's not gone on a vacation. He hasn't wound this up. He is transcendent, but he is eminent. He's not far from any of us, the scripture says. He's available 24-7, which none of us are able to do. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. So what does that mean for you and me? We can call upon him at any time. Have any of you been to the emergency room lately? I wonder why they call it that, because you have to wait a long, long time long time to get taken care of. Uh, Have you ever called one of your organizations when you're having trouble with your software and tried to get it resolved? Or any of you tried to get any headway on your taxes lately? It takes a long time. But aren't you glad that there is a God in heaven who heals, forgives, loves you with a passion, came, lived, died, and rose again that you might have life and have it abundantly? And he knows your name. And he knows everything about you. And he has revealed God the Father in his Son. I don't know about you, but it just blows my mind 
when I see Jesus down on his knees, God of heaven down on his knees, and he's mixing mud with his fingers. And he's got a blind man in front of him, and he puts the mud on him. And he can't see, and Jesus is patient. And in a little while, that man can see. That's what God is like. Can you see, uh, there was this woman, and I think she was set up. I think her husband was away. She may have been lonely. I think there were some other men because they wanted to really get to Jesus. And uh, they set her up, and she was weak, and she fell into uh, adultery. And uh, caught in the very act of it. And she was embarrassed and probably barely clothed when they pulled her. You notice that the the man got away scot-free, but the woman was caught. And she was taken in front of all of the religious leaders who were so scrupulous about the law. You know the Old Testament, what should be done to a woman. And they all had stones in their hands. And if you're wondering what God is like, then you can see Jesus come into that mix and say to them all, and he got down again and wrote. Some people wonder what he wrote in the sand. I think he wrote the names of the girlfriends of all of those guys. (laughs) That's what I think he wrote. And uh, one by one, they did what? They dropped their stones. And then Jesus turned to this woman who was embarrassed and said, Dub, Where are your accusers? She said, they all have left. And you know, I really believe that changed her life. But Jesus did not approve of her sin, did he? And he said to her some of the most compassionate words, now go and sin no more. That's what the God of heaven is like. How many of you are glad that he would rather give you mercy than justice? He would rather give you compassion instead of what you deserve. And so that's what our God in heaven is like. He'll feed the 5,000. And he will love us even when we are unlovely. And Jesus came to show us what the Father was really likes. How many of you are glad this morning? I don't have a bunch of rules. I don't have a bunch of rituals. I have a relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It will transform your life. Do you know why? It's not about laws. It's all about love. Can you say amen? And love makes the greatest difference in our lives. So important. The next thing that Jesus uh, came for was to seek and save the lost. And we, we need to, to, to understand that he left heaven because he was concerned about the lostness of individuals. If you have ever been lost, it's a scary thing. I can remember my wife and I, we were dating many years ago. We've been married 34 years. We were dating, I don't know if this was 35 years ago, 36 years ago. They go by fast, don't they? We were out berry picking in a place called Ava. And uh, we got lost in the woods. Have any of you been to West Leiden, Ava, and territory like that? Uh, we, we, we got lost. And uh, I'll tell you what, I was terrified because it was getting dark. And uh, it began to be, you know, I, I led this young lady out in the woods, and, and my intentions were noble. I want you to know that, okay? And, uh, and we were picking berries, and uh, we, we got turned around, but I felt very responsible. And I can remember picking up my pace. My heart started picking up its pace. I couldn't recognize where we were. I didn't know the way out. And I began to run literally run. And I can remember crossing the Mohawk River and uh, coming out on the other side, wishing that I would find some indication of where in the world are we. And the sun 
was going down. It's terrifying to be lost. It really is. But I want to tell you, we got found, and I'm here today. That's evidence of that. But it was wonderful to finally come out of the woods, find a road, go to a house, make a telephone call, and get picked up by her mother, who was very glad to see us. Uh, it's terrifying to be lost. Do you think that God knows the terror that comes from lostness? Of you sitting in your bed and staring up on the ceiling and wondering, where are you going to spend eternity? And you've thought about, well, there's heaven, and maybe I'll make it there, but maybe I won't. And is this whole deal about hell, this place where Jesus said the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched, where people are in eternal agony, is that a place that I could end up? And that's terrifying. And uh, Jesus knows the terror of that. Some people can recognize it when, uh, when you're swimming. Have any of you ever been swimming and you started to drown? Some of you shake your head. I know what that's like. I went to Boy Scout camp. They're not so nice sometimes. They're going to teach me to swim. I grew up in a city. We didn't swim much. Behind Dandy Donuts and Kentucky Fried Chicken. There wasn't a lot of pools in our neighborhood. And so they were going to teach me to swim. Guess what they did? They threw me in the water. All over my head. And everybody expected... I would what? Swim. I want to tell you, I did a lot of things, but it wasn't swimming. <laughs> and one of the guys on the dock stuck a pole in the water, and I was able to grab a hold of that pole. Let me tell you what, when that pole was there and I had something solid ground, there was nothing that was going to get my grip from loosening from that pole. But I know the feeling of water starting to fill your lungs and frantically fraying in knowing I am going down. Any of you have been in a fire? I use the terminology because that's some of the terminology that really best explains lostness. To be in a burning building and you can't get out. Have you ever been in a situation like that? It is terrifying. And uh, Jesus knows that terror in our soul. And he came to seek and save people like you and me that were lost and couldn't find our way. That were in a building that was burning, couldn't get out. You can relate that to your lifestyle. Feeling very trapped and not knowing how to make it better. Or going down and under and perishing. And so Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. And in Luke 19, 9 and 10, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came for what? To seek and save that which was lost. He came looking for me. He came looking for you. He knew the terror that's in your soul and in my soul knowing that we're not right with God, God's holy, we're not. The divide is very great. There's no way for us to mend it. All the good things in the world can't make up for the evil things that we have all done. As the Bible says, we're all sinners and separated by our sin from a holy God. But here was an example of a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. And he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And then Jesus came by, and what did he say to Zacchaeus? Now, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree, because I'm going to your house today. I'm going to your house today. And the Bible tells us that as Jesus sat down with this man, who had a tremendous need, did he, was his need financial? No. His need was spiritual. And although he had everything that money could buy, I think he was a little light on real friends. And he really wondered what love really meant, like so many people do in our society. And Jesus went to his house and had dinner with that guy. And the most amazing thing happened. His life was transformed because he met the master. And that's why Jesus came. 
He came for Zacchaeus, and he came for the Samaritan woman, but he also came for Sam Macri, who lived on 407 Robert Street. And he came for you. And how many of you are glad he did? How many of you are glad to be found today? Praise God. Amen. Notice what uh, John has to say. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. I, I just can't tell you, if you were a Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ, if I were to somehow be able to tell you and show you your destiny, uh, can you imagine the scripture says we're going to live in a place called heaven. We're going to have a change of address. How many of you are looking forward to that? especially as we're in central New York and it's getting towards winter time, Some of us would like a change of address. Some of you are trying to do something about that because you say goodbye to me and go to Florida and you say hello when the snow goes away. Uh, but I want you to know that's only temporary because there's a place called heaven and I don't know if there's going to be any snow there. Uh, but, you know, I may look at you now and you may be working, you know, down at the gas station or you may be over at Par Technologies or you may be at Luke's Hospital or you may be someplace else. But I want to tell you, what you are today is not anything of what you will be. Can you say amen? And what is in store for you and me? The Bible says the eye hasn't seen it nor the ear has heard it nor has it even entered. And I want to tell you, there is a lot of people with wild imaginations out there. i got to tell you, there's stuff that's happening in the technological field. I just can't even believe it. A, a, a lady told me the other day, in our church, she just got the results back. They put a camera in a pill. Can you believe it? She ingested it. It was able to go down through, and I won't describe those wonderful parts of our body that you can't see that are there, but we all appreciate, and we especially know when they're not working right. Can you say amen to that? But they took a camera, and they were able to take frame by frame the pictures of her insides. And the report came back that things are good. Praise God. Praise God. That's amazing. And, and men thought that up. I, I, I just can't imagine some of the things that technology is doing. I'm blessed by it. How many of you are just amazed that you can take your little phone out and you can do so much stuff on your little phone now? It's just amazing what you can do. But the Bible says this, the eye has not seen or the ear heard, nor has it even entered. And I don't care if you're into quantum physics or which you're into. The Bible says it hasn't even entered into the mind of man the things in store for those that love God. And I want to tell you, Jesus came to seek and save you and me so that we would be able to realize that day when we would be in a place that was beyond our imagination, beyond belief, and it is going to be the best that we could ever, ever come up with in our wildest dreams, all because Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we will be what? Like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Now when John saw Jesus on the Isle of Patmos, what did he look like? Anybody remember? On the Mount of Transfiguration, we talked about metamorphose. What was on the inside of Jesus came to the outside. But John saw Jesus on the Isle of Patmos, and it says his eyes were like a flame of fire, didn't it? It says his hair was like wool. It talked about his shoes being like they're burning in a, in a furnace. And he, was, he, he fell down like a dead man, in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, revealed in the book of Revelation. You remember he did what? He walked among the lampstands that were a representation of the churches. And Jesus had something to say to those churches. And I want to tell you, uh, as we think about our future, we think about Jesus Christ, it, it is truly uh, mind-blowing. Uh, in it. And all have this hope purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might what? Take 
away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Now that's a pretty significant verse. What is it talking about? Well, in the Greek languages, there are these things called tenses. And one of the tenses is continuous action. And a continuous action means that you do it all the time, day by day. It is a lifestyle. It is your natural routine. And so the Bible says in one place, if you say you have no sin, what does it tell you? You are a liar and the truth is not in you. This is not a contradiction. What it is saying is, is that it is even for Christians, they sin when? From time to time, they sin. That is true about Christians and non-Christians. But about believers in Christ, what it says is, it is impossible for someone who has been redeemed, truly redeemed, truly found, to sin as a lifestyle over and over and over again. Can you say amen? Aren't you glad that Jesus is calling us up to a higher standard, to live holy? to be like him. That is the reason he came. He wants us to be conformed to what? Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the word of God. And we are to be not Christ, not God, but we're to be like God. And how many of you are enjoying the sanctification process that we're in? Sometimes he'll put you on the anvil, won't he? Sometimes he'll, he'll take you to the back of the barn. Any of you familiar with that? We used to call it getting a licking. You're going to get a licking for that. And I want you to know, will, will God sometimes take us out to the woodshed and discipline us as children? Not because he's mad at us or that he hates us, but because he loves us. And if we don't receive discipline, the Bible says we're not legitimate what? Children of the Lord. So when discipline comes, how should we receive it? We should receive it with the right attitude because what is the reason Jesus came? To seek and save that which was lost, but to not leave him like he found him. Aren't you glad Jesus is not satisfied to leave you how you were? And so praise God that it was in his mind and in his heart. And then he came to start, serve, and send out his church. He came to start, to serve, and send out his church. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build what? My church. Now I want you to know the church is not a continuation of the old economy in the Old Testament. It's just not a continuation of Israel. I want you to know that. The church is a brand new thing. It is the ecclesia of God. What did Jesus say about taking wine and putting it into old wineskins? Taking new wine and putting it into old wineskins. What did he say was bound to happen? The people would see it all the time. What would happen? The, 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 the wine would cause the old wineskins to expand and then they would burst and it would be wasted. You put new wine into what? New wineskins. And then they are preserved. The wine is preserved in that. And so we just don't have an old economy of the Old Testament. We have something brand new. How many of you are glad to be the called out assembly of Jesus Christ, the Lord of all? Praise God, that's who we are. So Jesus came to establish and start his church. I don't know about you, but I love the church. Do you? The people of God. I don't know what I would do without the people of God. Loving me, encouraging, caring for me. Now I heard the comment this morning. Someone said, well, the church is the only organization that shoots its wounded. How many of you have heard that? Any of you heard that? Is that true? It, it is true in some senses. Can you get hurt in the church? Why can you get hurt in the church? Because you're here. Okay? Because I'm here. 
Are we completely finished? Are we completely Christ-like? No. And so from time to time, could you expect to be part of the Lord's body and get hurt in the church? And when you get hurt in the church, should you walk around like, oh, I can't believe it. I went to the church and I was with these bunch of sinners that are in process, and I'm one of them, and somebody hurt me in the church. I want to tell you, how many of you would show up for work Monday morning if that was the case with your work? Oh, I went to work and, and somebody got on my back or someone got on my nerves or someone said something to me. No, you know what I find? People go to work on Monday morning because they like to eat the rest of the week. <laughs> they just do. And they put up with all kinds of nonsense at work. But in the church, oh no, somebody looked at me cross-eyed and I, oh, I, I didn't expect that. I thought it was going to be heaven on earth and we were going to be in glory land and I can't believe they said that or did that. And I want to tell you, it's really easy to point the finger that way, isn't it? But you always have to remember that there are lots of them pointing back at you. But this is ought to be, ought to be different in the church. In the church, we ought to mend fences as quickly as possible if we can. Can you say amen to that? So if we got ill feelings, we got hurt feelings, we don't run away. Because I'm just going to tell you, you can run from this church, and you can run down to the church down the street. And you're taking your chances because they might be worse than us. <laughs> you know, better to live with the devil you know sometimes. <laughs> Can I say it that way? At least I've got history with you guys, right? Okay. And you can run down the street. You don't know what you're going to run into down there. And I want to say, why don't you stick around? Can you say amen? Uh, I really appreciate your expressions of love this morning and pastor appreciation sunday i, I just want you to know I, I i really do um i've been here 23 years i'll be coming up on a quarter of a century that's a lot of time and compared to the national average i'm way beyond where most pastors stay with their churches you want to know the reason i stay because I love you. You need to know that. And I'm going to keep on loving you. Have I ever been hurt here as a pastor? Yeah. But God has sent me here. He's called me here. And I want you to know this morning, thank you very much. And I am privileged to be the pastor of Cross Point Church in Whitesboro, New York. <clears throat> I was at uh, an annual meeting of our association yesterday. And not only do we need to understand that Jesus has a heart of compassion for the last, but we need to have that compassion driving us. And uh, Rick Martin has been a pastor in our association. We've been to Peru 17 times to a particular area. We have on evangelistic preaching, and we have won people to Christ in Peru. As a matter of fact, Edgar, our dear brother, went as a, a missionary from our church, saw people impacted and come to Christ. Been back there 17 times. Every time that we leave, people in the community beg us. Do you hear what I'm saying? Beg us. Will you please send someone here who will stay with us and teach us the word of God? And Rick Martin stood in the pulpit and he said, we've been there 17 times. We've tried to work with an indigenous pastor that was there on the field to get him to please do that for these people that are begging for the word of God. Could you imagine people begging for the word of God. We're afraid to go to our friends in Laotas because we think they don't want the word of God. These people are begging for the word of God. And he said, every time we leave, and there's nobody there, the people that got saved drift apart, go back to their own business. And he said this. He said, I can't stand it anymore. He said, my wife and I 
have surrendered our life to go to Peru. We've asked God, send someone, send someone, send someone. But we're going to teach them the word of God. He said, I can't sleep at night because those people don't have the word of God. I'm telling you what, that's the kind of heart that God can bless and that's the kind of heart that God can work with because that's the heart of God. To leave heaven, to come to earth because people desperately need Jesus Christ. We had another guy by the name of Wes. I got a picture of him and his family. He's serving us in Spain. He's got a middle son who has cerebral palsy. Uh, he, it's hard work. Uh, he's been there, and a bunch of missionaries have left the area because it's so hard, and people are so resistant, and progress is so slow. Don't all of us like to see stuff happen? Don't we like to see, I mean, the big boom, and everybody gets saved, and the churches grow and grow and grow? But what about in the areas where it's so hard you can hardly break it? And this guy, he asked him, why? don't you quit and get your family out of there. He said the same thing. I cannot bear to believe. He said, for evangelical churches in Spain, there is one evangelical church for every 410,000 people. I can support a guy like that. How about you? And you are. And for our church, I met a guy at the annual meeting. He is a Vietnamese. He is traveling from Endicott to guess where every week and has for the last two years, and I didn't even know it, to Utica. He is working with a small group of Vietnamese. He's won some of them to Christ. And get this, Cambodians are joining them, and Cambodians are getting saved. Did you know that there are 21,000 immigrants, guess where? In Utica. Out of the five dropout places in the United States where they drop immigrants off, the Bosnians, the Burmese, and you just name these groups, the Russians, guess where it is? It's Utica, New York. We have the world at our doorstep. And I got to tell you what, as he shared... He's driving from Endicott, New York. I drove there yesterday. Guess how many hour drive it is? Two and a half hour drive. From there to here every week. Why? Somebody tell me why. Because there are lost people in Utica, New York. He's going to leave his job and relocate to Utica, New York. And I'm excited about that. I met him. I said, we need to meet together and we need to talk and we need to partner because we are here to seek and save that which was lost. And we have to do it in as many ways as possible. Can you say amen? We're not a huge church, but with every resource we have, somebody tell us what's our business because it was the Lord's business. Seeking and saving that which was lost. That's what we're here for and we've got to do it to the mat. So Jesus came to start his church. Then he came to serve his church. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church. Does Jesus serve his church? Absolutely. The illustration of a husband serving his wife. Ladies, how would you feel if your husband did that for you? That he was concerned about you being clean, concerned about you being holy, concerned about presenting you to his father as a radiant church without any stain or any... Suppose your husband had his mind that he wanted you to become all the woman of God that you could ever possibly be, and he was tirelessly working with you and serving you. I cannot believe Jesus came. He was second person in the Trinity. He said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for money. The idea of the God of the universe getting down on his hands and knees and saying to you, Wayne, how can I serve you? Blows my mind. 
Shouldn't you be the one polishing his shoes? That's how it is in this world. But Jesus came and gave us an example, and we are to what? Serve one another in love. And so he came to start his church. He came to serve his church, and he's, he's working with us. How, how, how often is he working with us? 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And he is there for us. And so he came to serve his church. And I want to ask you this. Are you serving his church? With the gifts and talents that you have, with the, the treasure that you have, are you serving the bride of Christ? How do you feel about the bride of Christ? I want to encourage some of you who are not members of our church, you're very regular attenders, and if I'm wrong, tell me. I, I love you a lot. And I got to tell you, many of you, you're more consistent than some of our members. Did you know that? You are in church and in Bible study more than some of the members of our church. I'd like you to consider membership in the body of Christ here. And if I'm wrong about this, let me know. It's not enough to be a member of the universal church. For one thing, when you get sick, what is the telephone number of the universal pastor? Did somebody tell me that? What's the telephone number for the universal deacons? In the, in the early church, they used to have lists in the church because they had widows. And the scripture says pure and undiviled religion is what? Ministering to the orphan and the widow. That's what Jesus said. It was, that was pure. That was really meant a lot to God the Father. And they used to have lists in the church, which suggests what? They had a membership role in their church. And so they knew who was a part of the church and who was not a part of that local congregation. And so people were responsible with real pastors. How could you possibly be under the leadership of every single pastor of every single church and you could be accountable to the whole universal church and all of its leadership? And where are you going to put your gifts and talents? Are you going to be able to serve every church that exists in the world? No. That's why you have what? Local churches with local pastors. The universal church is mentioned about 10 times in Scripture. But the local church is mentioned about 180 times, referred to and mentioned. Local ecclesias, called out assemblies. And they had what? They had pastors and teachers and those kind of things. You can't possibly be accountable or held accountable to the universal whatever. I want you to know the Bible strongly talks about membership in a local church. Are you a member of a local church and putting your gifts and your talents and your service in that local church and through that local church? And so you need to, to really consider that. We would love for you to become a part of us, be committed to us. It, it's very, very important uh, that you consider that. And tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong. I, I would stand to be corrected about this. But membership in a local church is extremely, extremely important. Real people, real needs, real service. Uh, it's, it's a commitment. And you'll always grow in the face of a commitment. Then Jesus came to them and said, this is sending the church out. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus sent his church out. Now, I just want to tell you what we're going to be doing as a local church and how you can be generous uh, through this holiday season, and here's some of the things that our church, we feel sent out. Do you feel sent out by the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you take the Great Commission seriously? That I am a follower of Jesus Christ, he's talking to me. All authority has been given to me, Jesus said, and what are we supposed to do? What is our commission? Somebody tell me what our commission is. We're supposed to, you're supposed to do what? Go and make disciples. Is that for every Christian? Everyone. Not just for Pastor Sam, not just for the deacons, not just for the trustees, not just for those that work in fellowship, not for those. It's for what? 
every person is to go and make disciples of all nations. Do we have all nations right around us here in Utica? Yeah, we do. Baptizing them, after they become believers, we're to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then we're supposed to, it doesn't stop there, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so we're supposed to teach everything that Jesus has commanded. And how are we going to do that? Now, how are we going to do some of that? This Christmas, uh, we have our Operation Christmas Child. How many of you are thrilled that we're a part of that effort? A hundred million boxes are going to be going out and uh, you have an opportunity, and I want you to think, will you be generous this Christmas? My whole campaign this Christmas for the church is all about generosity. Last year I focused on the gift. This year I'm going to focus on the giver. I want us to give like we've never given before. We were in a Sunday school class this morning, and it was uh, talking about feeding the 5,000. How much did that little boy have? Anybody remember the story? Anybody know how much it was? Five loaves and three fish. And how much, what did God do with that? He multiplied it and he took care of this humongous need. Are there humongous needs out there? Yes, there are. But can you and I give the little resources we have to God and God take that and meet tons and tons of needs? I, I, I think it's so critical that we understand that. And I just... Uh, quickly read this. I know our time's going by, but I haven't preached long in a long time. Aren't you glad? Some of the favorite words in church are finally. Alex is an eyewitness of two of the greatest tragedies of our generation. As a young boy, he watched his mother die of AIDS. Then he watched his grandmother and uncle clubbed to death in 1994 in a Rwanda genocide. He grew up in an African orphanage. That was the same time Operation Christmas Child was starting to grow. 20 years ago, Samaritan Purse sent out its first 28,000 shoebox gifts to children affected by the war in Bosnia. In 1994, Rwanda was the second country we reached with Christmas Child, and we remembered the gifts, especially the candy, just having something that we could call our own, that soon after receiving his shoebox, Alice trusted Christ as his Savior, and the Lord began a remarkable transformation in his life. He had the opportunity to travel internationally with the African Children's Choir and came to the U.S. for college where he earned a degree in pastoral counseling. This past spring, Alex returned to Aranda with Samaritan's Purse to hand out Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes in the very orphanage where he was raised. On the trip, God gave him the opportunity to visit in prison to meet the man who killed his uncle 19 years ago. Alex not only forgave him, but also prayed with him and shared the gospel with him. Now God is calling him to go home to Aranda and plant a church to help him bring reconciliation through the good news of Jesus Christ. Is that awesome or what? Is God amazing or what? We started many years ago in Operation Christmas Childs. The goal is 100 million boxes this year. I want, I'm, I'm asking that we do more than we've ever done before. And here's my scripture verse, and I, I'll, I won't take too much more time are you enjoying yourself as much as me? Okay. Let, let, let's, look. let's look here at chapter, chapter 8 in the book of 2 Corinthians. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonians. Out of the most severe trial, see, they were a local church. Uh, it, it says, given to the Macedonian church, churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own. And look at this church, these churches in Macedonia. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in his service to the saints. 
And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, then to us in keeping with God's will. Is that amazing? I wrote down two words for us. I want to be like that this holiday season, don't you? It's, it was way too quiet. <laughs> way too quiet. I'll commit my first, myself first as a leader of this church. I want to look as, as much as I can give, and then I want to give beyond my ability. How about you? This Christmas, if we do what we can, we're only going to see what we can do. But if we give beyond, then we're going to see what God can do. How many of you want to see what God can do through this holiday season? Only what God can do. As I look at our missionaries, I look at our missions program, I look at things like the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, I want us to have the largest offering we've ever had for Lottie Moon in the history of our church this year. I will easily spend over $1,000 easy on Christmas presents in my family. I'll just be honest with you. And my family's growing. And I got granddaughters. Look out. I, I don't pay any attention, okay? Because I love those girls. It's not hard to give. And I look at what I give my family. And I want to look at what I give the Lord. And I don't want it to be said of me this holiday season that I gave more to mine than I gave to his. Because frankly, and my family's here, we got enough stuff. But there are people out there that don't know Jesus. So I'm going to give the missions like I've never given to it before this year. And I'll lead the way as your pastor. I want you to know that. Because Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. And he came and he started and he served and he sent out his church to continue his work. And so I'm looking at giving beyond my ability this Christmas and the church giving beyond it. We also have the gift wrapping at our local stores. How many of you are thrilled about that? We're going to go back to Kmart. <laughs> going to go back to Kmart. We're going to wrap people's gifts, but this year we are doing something, something a little sneaky. Is that okay? Can we say it? It's sneaky, okay? It is. We are going to, and this is what we learned this morning, is it enough to meet people's physical needs and that's it? To clean their basement, wash their windows, wrap their gifts without sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Woe to us. People will be better fed, better clothed, and still end up in a place called hell. So we've got to make sure that, and so this is what we're going to do. We have partnered with a ministry called True Life Ministry. I'm excited about this holiday season. It's True Life Ministry, and for you, it's going to be real easy. All you have to do is when you wrap that gift, you stick this card on it. On that card, there's a website address. It already has our church on it. Is that cool? Because somebody in our congregation heard me talk in a Sunday school class. This is the kind of heart we have in our church. Sunday school class and in the evening class. I walked into the office that Monday morning and, and uh, John told me, he said, I just wanted you to know somebody in our church loves God, loves the church, and, uh, and loves people, and uh, totally underwrit the cost of partnering with True Life Ministries. And you're going to get a little card. You stick it on there. They go to the website, and they can hear people like Ravi Zacharias. Is that cool? And learn people that were like, they were, they're, they're now born-again Christians, but they were ex-Jehovah's, they were Jehovah's Witnesses. They were Mormons. They talk about what it was like to be a Mormon and to grow up in that and to be one and practice that and then be liberated. Isn't that what Jesus is, does? Be liberated by the life-changing truth of Jesus Christ. And now they're followers of Jesus Christ, and they're reaching back into these cults, pulling out people just like them to come to know Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. Are you excited about that? Does that blow your mind? And you'll be able to give out those cards at the gas station, at the lumber yard. You'll be able to give out those cards where you, uh, where you frequent and shop. Some of you ladies, you know the cash register lady. And I'm going to tell you this is the bottom line. 
You can't win people to Christ without building relationships. Can you say amen? And what we've got to do really, really like we've never done before, we've got to build relationships with people. It may start with a card. It may be followed up with a track. It may be a visit to someone's house or an invitation. I'm going to ask you this. Are you willing to have people to your house that you don't know that you would make friends with for the sole purpose of not getting a good deal or not making vital connections, but so that you could see their soul saved and that they will end up in a place called heaven forever. So I'm like done. And you're glad. Oh, finally, brethren, <laughs> we also have the giving tree. Praise God. And uh, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be a great Christmas. But the Bible tells us this. God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. And Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And we're going to find that out together in the days ahead. Why did Jesus come? To show us what God the Father is really like. Why did Jesus come? To seek and save that which is lost. Why did Jesus come? To start, serve, and send out his church. Praise God. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the word of God. Thank you for liberty to share your word. I want to thank you, Lord, uh, for the church that you've given me to pastor and to love. Help me to do it better in the days ahead, but help us to understand our purpose. Many people interested when Jesus came, how Jesus came, but why he came is the most important thing. And that why he came is the reason why we go. Or we'll go to our neighbors, our friends, and our family because we were commanded to go, because we were encouraged to go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come to Jesus Christ. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for what that means. We have a large work ahead of us, but we have a big God. And we thank you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior. Hmm. Lord, as we contemplate that, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. And thank you for sending us. Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you, they just had ritual, routine. I pray today they will walk an aisle, that they will grab a pastor's hand, that they will say, I'm giving myself over to Jesus Christ. I forsake my sin I, I cannot change myself, but I believe this Jesus you spoke about today who could heal the sick, who is God in the flesh, can make me the man or the woman, the boy or the girl that you ever intended for me to be, O oh Lord. And so I come asking for forgiveness and committing myself as best I know how to follow this Jesus the rest of my life. Lord, how I pray someone will do that today. For the rest of us, Lord, speak to our heart, O oh God. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.